6, so if you would turn with me there in your Bibles. Luke chapter 5, verses 12 through 26. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded for a proof to them. But now even more, the report about him went abroad, and great <coughs> crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. But he would withdraw to desolate places, Pray. On one of those days, as he was teaching, Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there, who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with him to heal. And behold, some men were bringing on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were seeking to bring him in and lay him before Jesus. But finding no way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and let him down with his bed through the tiles into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to question, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? When Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them, Why do you question in your hearts which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them and picked up what he, he had been lying on and went home, glorifying God. And amazement seized them all, and they glorified God and were filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. The reading from God's Word, may He add a blessing to our hearts this morning. Well, narrative in Scripture, narrative in Scripture isn't something that God has put in the Bible so that He can keep our interest up before we get to the prophecies and the epistles and the and, and the Psalms. Maybe uh, Scripture's purpose is to reveal uh, God's plan of redemption. All of Scripture has that purpose. Uh, the narrative also. So I want to draw our attention back to what Luke stated right at the beginning of this epistle. When we began this epistle, we looked at the purpose, uh, why Luke wrote it. You remember back in chapter 1 and verse 6, uh, Luke says that he wrote this epistle so that Theophilus would have assurance of the things that he had already been taught. And so that's what Luke is trying to establish here. He is, he is trying to establish uh, the plan of salvation so that the people who are reading it Immediately, Theophilus, and beyond that, we who are reading it, would understand something of the plan of redemption, would have assurance because of what we are reading. And in this particular part of Luke's gospel, he is uh, establishing for us a small part of the plan of redemption, that is, the centrality of Christ. If you miss uh, what Luke is setting before us here today, that Christ is the one who forgives sin, you forget, uh, you miss the entire message of Scripture. And so Luke has said that before Theophilus and before us, that we would understand clearly how the history or the plan of redemption works itself out. And what I want to do this morning is uh, look at these two uh, miracles, uh, first from the practical perspective. What happens from what we touch and see and hear. What is taking place in the healing of the leper? What happens when the paralytic is healed? So we want to look at each of those uh, miracles in turn. But then I want to turn our attention in the end to something that is made very clear at the end of the healing of the paralytic, which is what is the ultimate goal of Christ when he walks on this earth? It's not the healing of the body. It is the healing of the soul. So we want to look at the healing of the leper in verses 12 through 16. We want to look at the healing of the paralytic in several verses, starting in verse 17. Then we want to look at the healing of the soul as Jesus lays it out for us in verses 20 through 26. 
So let's look first at the leper in verse 12. Uh, the city where this miracle is performed is not identified for us. We are uh, with Jesus in the narrative along the Sea of Galilee, right kind of in the northern part of what used to be the kingdom of Israel and Galilee of the Gentiles, the province of the Romans. And he is engaged in itinerant ministry there. He's going from city to city as he is proclaiming the good news. Uh, behold, uh, the, uh, repent and believe the kingdom of God is at hand. This is uh, the message of Christ and he is going around the countryside preaching that message and healing and proclaiming that news to those who would listen to him. And it says on one of those trips that he comes across a man, a leper. Now, when we talk of leprosy in the Bible, it could be a, a host of skin diseases, but uh, assuming the worst, it is not a good thing. Leprosy in that time was uh, terminal. There was no cure for it, and it was a slow and, and painful death. But more so than the physical harm that would come to a person who had a leprosy, there is a social stigma also in this time that is attached to this disease. Now, in Leviticus chapter 13, God, in his wisdom, he gives out great care, and he instructs the Levites what they are to do with somebody who has uh, different skin diseases and uh, different levels of leprosy. And they would have followed this with this man, these regulations that the Lord has given to them. But there is something that is uh, very dark in this opening verse of this miracle. It says there, there came a man full of leprosy. He doesn't just have one spot that he says, I wonder what this might be. He's covered in this terminal, disfiguring, life-ending illness. It would have been a slam dunk for uh, the Levites of his day to determine what they should have done to him. He would have gone and come back and they would have seen that the illness had not disappeared at all. And this would have been the final verdict in uh, Leviticus chapter 13. When the disease has been confirmed. In verse 45 it says, The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. And he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. This is... The disease that this man has. He has been an outcast, living alone, on purpose disheveled, wearing sackcloth. And if everybody, anybody ever dared uh, approach him, he was to call out, unclean, unclean, stay away from me. Don't come near. I have a leprosy. This man, he's uh, a man of no hope. There's no cure. There's only a slow and agonizing death that he looks forward to as a, as a leper in his day and in his age. He has nothing to commend himself, but yet he comes with only one source of hope. He comes to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he comes asking him that he would heal him. He comes surrendering himself to this kind rabbi that he's perhaps heard so much about. This is the man who, who heals people. He's heard about him. Even in his isolation, he knows who Jesus is. And so he comes and appeals to him. And he asks him that he would be cleansed. He doesn't know what Jesus will say, of course. He doesn't know if Jesus will say yes or no. But he knows that Jesus is able. And he comes surrendering himself entirely to his mercy. Now, this is somewhat unimaginable for us, but Jesus does that which the people of his time would never do, in verse 13. It says that Jesus stretched out his hand, he touched him. This man who is full of leprosy, he is touched by the Lord Jesus Christ, and then he speaks words that this man would have never imagined. If he were to come into the presence of, pretend for a minute that we're a, an old, or a, a synagogue at the time of Jesus, and a leper were to walk in these doors, the 
Presbyterianism would have been out the window and, and all of you would be sitting in the front rows. The leper would be at the back by himself. He would be saying, get away from me. I don't want what you have. You are unclean. But Jesus, in his mercy, does something very different. He reaches out and he touches the man. And he says words of healing. I will be clean. There are, in the Greek language, two very small words. But this man's life is changed forever. One minute, this man is covered with this disfiguring terminal illness. And then what does it say at the end of verse 13? It says, immediately the leprosy left him. That's what happens with Jesus' miracles, isn't it? It's not that it takes time for Jesus' words to take effect. When he calms the sea, he speaks, and immediately there's calm. And here, when he speaks to the leper, he speaks, I will be clean. He doesn't have to send somebody to make sure that they get the right medication from the drugstore and then apply it to the leprosy, and, and before you know it, it's gone. Immediately, the leprosy uh, leaves this man. I don't think there are words that we can use to describe what this man goes through as a result of this healing. I don't know that we could be able to comprehend the excitement and the joy that he feels. Not only is he physically cured, but now he is able to be integrated into his community, his family. He can be touched by people again. No longer does he have to walk all alone. No longer does he have to call out warning to the people who come near him. But his body is healed. And so you can imagine that he wants to tell everybody about it, doesn't he? But what does Jesus say to him? Jesus tells him to do something very different. Now, it's unlikely that the miracle of what happened to this man would, become, would remain unknown. But that's not Jesus' first focus. Jesus' first focus is not that this man would go talking about what has happened to him. What is his first focus? His first focus is to send him to the priests in obedience to the word of God. Now, why would Jesus tell this man to be quiet? It doesn't say in our passage, of course, but there's several reasons that we could consider. Maybe Jesus is telling him to re remain silent because the appointed time for uh, Jesus' popularity is, is not yet. I think that's unlikely since large crowds are already following Jesus. He's already uh, being surrounded by many people. The second option is that Jesus is drawing attention away from the event itself and pointing this man towards the Lord. I think that's uh, more likely that Jesus is saying to the man, what happened to you is of less consequence. Go and serve the Lord as a result. That is a greater consequence. Now, from the sister passage in, in Mark chapter 1, we know that this man uh, doesn't do what Jesus commanded him. He goes out into the con countryside and he spreads uh, the word about Jesus. And so Jesus' popularity continues to increase. But that is not the object of what Jesus is trying to accomplish here. If you look at verse 16. This great popularity that belongs to Jesus. I mean, in our day and age, Jesus is ready to be invited to speak at the Gospel Coalition, right? He is, the, he is a Christian superstar. He's on the rise. That's not what Jesus wants. He goes off by himself. He would withdraw to desolate places and he would pray. Well, why would Jesus do that? Because he seeks to do the will of his Father. He doesn't seek to have his own glory. Same thing with this uh, leper who has been healed. He doesn't seek that the man would speak of the miraculous powers of Jesus. He seeks that this man would have fellowship with the Father. That the, uh, the leper would, uh, would worship the Lord as he is to be worshipped. That's how the, the leper is healed. Let's think about the healing of the paralytic, starting in, in verse 17. Uh, with uh, this popularity that becomes part of Jesus' ministry. We see part of that playing into this, this miracle that takes place with the paralytic. Uh, but this miracle takes place in the city of Capernaum. That's the city where Jesus moved to after he lived in Nazareth. We know that from the sister passage again in Mark chapter 2. And here Jesus 
is well known. So well known that Pharisees and teachers of the law from all over, they come to hear uh, what he has to say. They want to hear him teach. And they gather around him. Now, these teachers of the law, these Pharisees, they're not the only ones who are interested in, in what Jesus says and what Jesus does. So also are uh, several men with a paralytic friend. And these men bring this paralytic to be healed. The problem is, of course, we see it in our passage that in verse 19, there's no way to get to Jesus. The crowd is so great that they can't carry this bed uh, through the crowd and set him down before the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, these men, to their great credit, they are undeterred, aren't they? They don't let a little bit of a crowd get in their way, and so they climb up uh, the side of the house. There would have been a ladder or a staircase that, that allowed them to go up on the roof of that house, and they, they walk up the roof, and, and they tear out the tiles, and they lower their friend in the middle of the crowd below. Now, I don't know about you, when you read that, it can create a bit of a a dissonant image in our own minds because we're thinking the tiles that we have in our bathrooms or the tiles that we have in our kitchen and, and to tear those apart you need some heavy duty equipment, right? You need a chisel and, and you need a, a hammer to break it up and then scoop it all out of the way and, 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 and then you can get to the subfloor. But in the Hebrew houses, the houses of this time, it was very different. There would be beams that laid across the house and then they would put a, a thatch or branches or something like that across the top of the roof they would cover it with mud. So to get through a roof like that is quite a bit more simple than uh, getting through a grounded ceramic tile. So when we think about them removing the tiles from the roof, we must think of it along those lines. And so these, these men, even though they can't get to Jesus through the door, they go through the roof instead. And they could easily have removed uh, this brushwood with mud. And so they leave uh, their, brother, or their brother, their friend, on the floor in the presence of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it says in verse 24 and 25 that Jesus does heal this man. He commands him to pick up his mattress and to walk. And again, just like the leper, immediately this man's ankles, his legs are strengthened so that he can uh, work. Ten seconds ago, this man needed to be lowered through a roof. He needed to be carried through the town to get to Jesus. Now not only is he standing on his own two feet, but he's carrying the mattress that he was uh, lying on. There should be a, a joy in this man's life as well. <coughs> but when we come to Jesus' two miracles, we see that there is a common purpose. In the first miracle, the miracle of the, the leper, the purpose comes at the end where Jesus tells him to go show himself to the priests. It takes place after the miracle. He points the man to the obedience that he owes to the Lord, and he encourages him to live in obedience to the Lord. The second miracle, uh, the pointing to God, comes before, uh, before the miracle, the paralytic. There's an observation of their faith, and therefore he heals the man. It is in their singular determination to have this man laid before Jesus that they demonstrate their faith in Christ. Now, that's not a speculation, but that's what Luke observes Jesus to say. He sees the, the labor of the men to bring their friend before him, and he says, in response to an observation of their faith, that he will heal uh, this man. But in each case, Jesus' primary concern is not the por performance of the miracle, but that to which the miracle points, that which, which the miracle will prove. So I want to back up a little bit in the miracle of the paralytic and consider uh, Jesus and the healing of the soul as primary. So as we look at both of these miracles and what is accomplished, we're beginning to see a little bit more clearly what's taking place. Jesus sees the faith of the men, these friends, and he recognizes the need. Now what does Jesus recognize first in verse 20? He sees their faith and he says to the man, get up, take your mat and walk. No. He sees the man and he says, because of your faith, your sins are forgiven. He says, your sins are forgiven. Well, why does Jesus make that jump? Well, what does Jesus know about the human condition? What does the human being need more than physical health? He needs spiritual health. Before his body being healed will do him any good, he needs his soul to be cleansed. 
In Scripture, there are many other people who perform miracles. Uh, Moses is used by the Lord to perform many miracles. Elisha and Elijah both perform miracles. But none of those prophets, none of those men ever come to a person and say, your sins are forgiven. Moses makes water come from the rock. Elisha makes a, an axe head float. He even raises a little boy from the dead. But in none of those miracles do they speak of the forgiveness of sins. That is because forgiving sin is uniquely God's prerogative, isn't it? It's not something that belongs to men at all. There's no man here who can forgive sin. Now, I understand we may forgive a person's sin when they wrong us. Right? When, when, uh, when you fuss at your wife and you shouldn't fuss at your wife. I mean, you hear about this. It doesn't happen in your family, I know. But <laughs> you hear about this. And you're, you know, you're supposed to ask for forgiveness for, for the sin that you commit against the person. But primarily, when you fuss at your wife undeservedly, who are you sinning against? Primarily, you're sinning against God. Primarily, you're, you're violating the commandments of God. And so you're uh, indebted to Him. And it's talking of this final removal of the guilt that belongs to each of us as human beings. This forgiving of sins, which is only uh, uniquely God's work. So the scribes and the Pharisees, they don't miss it for a second, do they? Immediately their minds start working. It says in verse 21, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? What are they saying? This Jesus, he's taking on himself divine properties. He is calling himself God. He is saying that he is able to forgive sin. Now, for the scribes and the Pharisees, this is a problem because they don't believe that Jesus is God. They think that he is a man. Uh, they think he's making a false claim. But uh, Jesus' response in this is significant. Jesus restates and shows them that it's not blasphemy at all. For God to say that he is God is not blasphemy. For Jesus to say that he is God is not blasphemy, it is the truth. And Jesus asks a, a curious question in verse 23. He asks them, what is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or that you should rise up and walk. <clears throat> now, to do either of those things is equally difficult. It's equally difficult to command a person to rise up and walk and to uh, forgive someone's sin. Why? Well, both of those can only be done by the power of God. They are only God's work to do that kind of healing and to perform that kind of ministry in the life of a person. But Jesus isn't asking them which is harder to do. He's asking them, which is harder to say? It is much harder to say, rise up and walk. Why? Because for you to say, your sins are forgiven, there's no way that anybody can check on that until the second coming. Right? There's no way for anybody to know whether or not that is true. There's no check uh, that can be applied to you. It's not like you can, uh, Jesus says the words and you can look, well, say, look, there's still a pile of sin here. It's not done yet. It's not forgiven. It's still nailed to this man's back. His burden is still just as heavy as it was before. There's no way to check it. But if Jesus says, rise and walk, and the man can't do it, his ministry is gone. It's over. Because everybody can look and say, you claim to be this God. But here is a man that you commanded to be healed and He's no better at all. So, saying your sins are forgiven is easier. But uh, Jesus doesn't stay there. He tells the man to get up and walk. Now, why does Jesus do that? He tells us in verse 24. But that you may know that the Son of Man has, a, has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus performs the miracle not add to his popularity. He doesn't perform the miracle so that lots of folks would be in awe of his power. He performs the miracle so that everybody who is there would know 
where they should flee for forgiveness. It is what is accomplished in the leper, flee to God in response to what is done, and it was done in the life of the paralytic. I will do this so that you will know where you should flee. Uh, Jesus, in John chapter 14, verse 6, uh, says that he is the way, the truth, and the light. We know that passage uh, fairly well. But then there's this one, which maybe not so popular in our day and age. It says, no one comes to the Father except through me. What is Jesus establishing here? There's only one way to have your sin forgiven. There's only one way. And that way is through Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ alone. And to the Pharisees, he's saying that you will find forgiveness. And to the friends, he is saying, you will find forgiveness. And to everybody else who is there, he's saying, you will find forgiveness. You will be reconciled to God in one way and in one way alone. Through the ministry of the Son of Man. Through Christ and through Christ alone. Now, the people who observe these miracles, they, they understand at least in part what's taking place. It says... That amazement seizes them and that they glorify God and they're filled with awe, saying, We have seen extraordinary things today. They recognize the power of God at work in Christ. They recognize that what they're seeing is not seen in any other place on the planet. So, these miracles, they, they point us to the healing of the soul. So, what, what does it mean? For you, and for you, here we are, two thousand years later. What does it matter? Well, I think in the first place, it reminds us that as human beings, we ought not to neglect our spiritual health. Uh, J.C. Ryle, in his commentary on this passage, wrote the following. He said, "We must not. We must allow no difficulties to check us, and no obstacle to keep us back from anything which is really for our spiritual good, especially." We must bear this in mind in the matter of regularly reading the Bible, hearing the gospel, keeping the Sabbath holy, and private prayer. Why does J.C. Ryle think he needs to say that? It's because by nature we pay far more attention to our physical health than to our spiritual health, don't we? So often we neglect the spiritual good that is ours of uh, pastoring Waynesburg, first president, just listened to a sermon of his, and he said, he gave this example of his own life. He said, sometimes when I go to a restaurant, I order something that looks good on the menu, and my wife will point out to me that it's actually on the healthy selection. And so he changes his order, because he doesn't want the healthy thing. And we're in the same way when it comes to our spiritual good. Uh, we don't seek that which is for our spiritual good oftentimes. We actually do the things that are for our spiritual detriment, and we see it. That we don't have time for prayer. Prayer on our own, or prayer with our family, prayer in our congregation even. We don't have time to read the Bible. We just finished uh, watching a movie that lasted three hours, don't you know? And we're tired. We need, we need to go to bed. We don't have time uh, to read the Bible. We don't have time for church. I need my job. Don't you know that... Church interferes with my job or my hobby. In those instances, we're neglecting our spiritual health and seeking our physical uh, pleasure. Let me ask you a question. What if you were able to keep your job, but in keeping your job, you made a shipwreck of your faith because you're never under the preached word of God? Would that be a gain physically or a net loss physically. It's possible that you would keep your job and forfeit all the spiritual good and you will be the best dressed man entering into hell. You will have the most toys as you enter into hell because you will have made shipwreck of your soul. So I urge you to protect your spiritual health. And there are obstacles that will come our way. Job, family sometimes, our hobbies. But Christ tells us in his word that we're to seek first his kingdom and his 
righteousness. And what does he promise to us? We seek the spiritual good. And everything else that we need will be given to us as well. Now, our needs, our, our assessment of our needs, and God's assessments of our needs may not always line up. But that is God's promise for you. That if you seek your spiritual good, he will supply you what you need for your physical good. Physical illness is to be preferred over spiritual death. And the order in which Jesus speaks to this man lays that before us very clearly. That we are to seek our spiritual health first. It would have been much better for this man on the mount if he had been spiritually forgiven rather than spiritually unforgiven and able to walk. All that means is that he's able to walk for a little while, but he still has to face the judgment. Of God. So don't neglect your spiritual health. Then second of all, I think spiritually, we need to see ourselves in the leper. You remember the first miracle, this man covered in leprosy. He had no, uh, no healthy part about him. Now the leper is physically what we are spiritually. Now the scripture doesn't interpret this miracle this way you understand. But we're drawing a connection between that which is true of the leper that which is true of us spiritually. Before Christ comes into this man's life, he was full of leprosy. He was completely unclean. What are we like before Christ comes into our lives? What are our hearts like? They're infected with a terminal illness. There's no hope for life in us. In fact, I mean, this analogy only goes so far because we're actually dead in our transgressions. But you see, you understand there's nothing beautiful about our hearts. It's completely polluted, and by all rights, we should be cast out from among the people of, of God. We should be spiritually crying out to anybody who comes into contact with us, unclean. Because that is what, what we are all like. Before Christ came into this leper's life, there was only suffering in his terminal illness, no hope of cure. We have an incurable leprosy in our own soul. It's called sin. We may try some self-cures. We may be doing some research on the internet as to how we can get better from this. Maybe we'll try to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and just be that little bit better. Maybe just read our Bible a little bit more. Maybe help our neighbor with their groceries a little bit sooner. Maybe we'll suppress the truth about God that even exists. Maybe we'll say it doesn't matter. But sin is terminal. Just like this man could have denied his leprosy for a time, eventually he's going to have to face up to the fact that he is dying, that he has no hope for a cure. But when he comes to Christ, when he looks to be cleansed by Christ in faith, the effect is, is instant. He is immediately healed. He is immediately cured. So does in our, our justification. I'm not talking about our sanctification now, but the process of learning to put sin to death. We're talking about our justification, how we are declared righteous in the presence of God. When we come to our God, our merciful God in faith, we come to Him crying out, Lord God, forgive us for our sins. And then He gives us the ten-year program of seven steps that we have to take to get rid of the sin. No. Immediately, we are cleansed. We are cleansed immediately. Now, we all sin against the law of God. If you don't think that you do, you should just look at the Ten Commandments a little bit. Do you ever place yourself ahead of God in your desires? You're an idolater. Do you ever think lustfully about a woman or women about a man? You're an adulterer. Do you ever lash out in anger, forget to rule your passion? You're a, a murderer. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. When we come to Christ in faith, having recognized that we cannot cure our souls, we cannot make ourselves better, the effect is instant. And so that's what we all are, the hundred or so lepers here, all of us in this room. We're either infected lepers, or we are healed lepers. But all of us are lepers. The only difference between us is where we have to turn for the cure for our leprosy. So, uh, we are to see ourselves in the level, to recognize the hope that comes in finding 
our salvation in Christ alone. These two miracles that we've examined this morning, they have one purpose. Each of them speak of how we are reconciled to the Father. The, the miracle of the leper, it takes place after the fact. It's like the miracle is saying, this has happened and now I'll live for God. The paralytic, it takes place before the fact. This is who I am. Now trust in me to be reconciled. But in both of them, the central message is salvation in Christ. 